Over the past month, series of terrorist attacks by the so-called Islamic State of Syria have claimed hundreds of lives in Paris, Beirut, Iraq, Russia, and Syria. Since the beginning of the Syrian war in 2011, over 250,000 Syrians have been killed, millions displaced in neighboring countries, possibly being one of the worst humanitarian catastrophes of our time. As Congress recently voted to halt the flow of Syrian refugees in the U.S., what is the fate of Syrian refugees in America? And what is Minnesota's role in this ongoing debate? I'm Rana Kamal. This is Our Issues, Twin Cities. As the Turkish coffee simmers and the aroma fills the apartment, Ramya remembers the good old days of Syria. We were happy. We had our family around us. Every Thursday we would go to my family's or my in-law's house. In one night, their lives changed after war had arrived on their doorstep. It was 5 a.m., and all of a sudden, we heard the sound of bombing and rumble on our apartment's rooftop. I woke up my five children. It was very cold. It was February. I took my children downstairs to my in-law's apartment. An hour later, my children's bedroom was bombed. If we stayed an hour longer, I would have lost all my children. After moving from one shelter to another, and with only their lives to spare, Ramya, her husband Muhammad, and their five children fled Syria by foot to seek safety and refuge in Jordan. They are one of millions of families who have left the war-torn country. They took us to a refugee camp in Jordan. We stayed four to five days in the camp and left. What was life like in the camp? The camp is unsuitable for living. It's a very difficult life there. There are three bathrooms for 4,000 people. How can anyone live this way? The camp is not prepared for this amount of people. It's a stadium without a roof. Eventually, the Abide family found an apartment for cheap rent. For three years, with no job, no income, they survived on pawning Ramya's gold. But it was a miraculous phone call that changed everything for the Abide family. They were offered the opportunity by the UN's refugee agency to leave Jordan and start a new life in America. Ten months later, and the Abide family arrived in Rochester last April. They are the first Syrian refugee family to resettle in Minnesota since 2011. What were your first thoughts when you entered America? We were welcomed with graciousness. They brought us to this home and it was completely furnished. This is a chance in a lifetime, one out of a hundred thousand. The rest of the hundred thousand Syrians continue to face extreme hardship. Over the last four years, almost 12 million people, equivalent to half the Syrian population, have been displaced by the conflict, including over 7 million displaced inside Syria. Four million have been driven out of their country and are living in refugee camps across Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and various European countries. You're really seeing a kind of humanitarian earthquake inside that country. Daniel is the president of the American Refugee Committee, a nonprofit that has been assisting refugee communities all over the world for over 30 years. They have been assisting Syrian refugees inside their country and in neighboring Middle Eastern countries since 2013. Are we witnessing one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time? Certainly. We believe very strongly that we're witnessing that. We're actually seeing the destruction of a country. When you have half of a country's population having lost their homes, you're really um, seeing something that's quite unprecedented. What has the situation been like on the ground? The situation on the ground is truly appalling. Uh, one way to think about it is um, in terms of the Haiti earthquake, right? So that captured the world's imagination and it certainly tapped into the world's compassion. Mm -hmm. But the crisis that um, had been unfolding inside of Syria is about four times the size in terms of human suffering. 
Since the Syrian war began, the U.S. has accepted 1,500 Syrian refugees. With over half the nation divided over the fate of the Syrian refugees, President Obama continues his pledge to accept 10,000 refugees to enter the U.S. by next year. A number that pales in comparison to the hundreds of thousands European countries have taken. And even after the recent attacks in Paris and Beirut, humanitarian groups continue to call on the U.S. to accept upwards of 65,000 refugees. Senator Amy Klobuchar has been at the forefront of the ongoing debate. As the leader of the free world, are we obligated to step in? I think we are obligated to take in some of these refugees. I don't think we necessarily have to be the lead country. Mm -hmm. Germany is assuming that role and Europe is assuming right. that role, though there's a lot of tensions there about how many refugees. Uh, but I think we should be taking our fair share. And in a, I came out with the number 65,000. That's half of what the UN asked us to take. Traditionally, we've tried to meet that obligation. And uh, so far, you know, we've done a couple thousand. The hope is uh, we can do 10. Through a detailed letter, Senator Klobuchar led a group of senators calling on our president to significantly increase the number of Syrians allowed to resettle in the U.S. What has changed since you wrote the letter and what more needs to be done? We wrote that letter back in the late spring mm -hmm. and I actually things have changed. I think that lifeless body of that little boy on the beach yeah. um, really captured the world's attention. And we know the solution is not just about taking in refugees. That is not the long-term solution. Uh, the solution is fixing the crisis in Syria, coming up with a mm -hmm. solution there so Assad can transition out mm -hmm. uh, and leave. Um, the solution is figuring out what we're going to do uh, with the refugees, most of which will end up in Europe, getting Saudi Arabia and some of the other Middle Eastern countries, uh, United Emirates, other countries to take um, more of the refugees. They're not really taking any now. Um, so there's a number of things that could be done if the world came together. So why do you think that there's a lack of political will to step in and allow a larger number of Syrian refugees to settle here in the U.S.? people get scared. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had issues with the Somalis, yep. um, but those issues are a relatively very small number mm. compared to the total population. We have a very aggressive U.S. attorney that's been doing a great job in working with the community. We have to remember we're getting those cases because we have uh, uh, over a dozen Somali police officers who've worked with the community who find stuff out mm -hmm. and bring it to the prosecutor's office. So that's part of why we've been able to bring those cases and that's a good thing. When we return, Minnesota's role in the world's largest refugee crisis. The images of Syrian refugees, children, the elderly, families, pouring into European and neighboring Middle Eastern countries fills our TV screens. Over four million Syrians and counting have left their country to seek safe haven. I have been at these entry points and seen in Greece what's happening. You have little yellow rafts uh, that were meant for eight, 10 people going down a river um, that are being used by 50 to 60 people by smugglers. The smugglers charge these people one to three thousand dollars a person. I've talked to them. I know that's a fact. So each raft is valued at 50 to 60 thousand by the smugglers. They don't care if people die. They don't care if people get thrown overboard. Um, a lot of the, uh, the vests that the Greeks have found have been filled with hay. They're just fake vests to make the parents feel better. And in fact, we saw very troubling videos from the Greek Coast Guard that showed smugglers on speedboats, sometimes they actually drive boats with the refugees on them, being chased by the Greek Coast Guard. And the way they divert them is by throwing children overboard. And so that is what is actually going on right now in the year 2015, not back in uh, 1940. Right. Uh, it's happening right now, and it is the biggest migration we've seen since World War II. The American Refugee Committee works alongside Syrians to help build safe conditions and provide protection, water, sanitation, and hygiene services, critical humanitarian aid that has been stripped away from them. Our focus is Syria itself. Yep. And so we work with Syrians inside of Syria to provide life-saving assistance to the very people that we've been talking about. 
Through the American Refugee Committee, Reem recently spent weeks in Turkey and Lebanon, assisting Syrian families who have fled attacks by their government and ISIS. What was the situation on the ground like for these Syrians? Well, actually, in Lebanon, as you know, Dana, there is more than, like, it's a small country of 4 million people. Now, you add to that 1.2 million Syrian refugees, 800,000 Palestinian refugees who already live in the country. Yeah. You can imagine how stretched the local, like, the country's resources must mm -hmm. be. Um, for different political reasons, Lebanon did not allow the establishment of former refugee camps, which means that refugees have to either rent, which you can imagine is very expensive for them, or have to stay in informal tented settlements that are basically, you know, small camps um, made of tents, or what we call collective shelters, which are also deserted public buildings or unfinished public buildings, such as schools and hospitals. Mm -hmm. So the living conditions are quite bad. So looking in, what was your experience like over there? It's been overwhelming, yeah. to be honest. But I had the honor to work with many Syrian families quite closely, yeah. visit them in their houses. Mm -hmm. They're very welcoming and they like to share whatever they have, even when resources mm -hmm. are scarce. Um, and the resilience they have is really remarkable. How important have your collaborative efforts been with the Syrian people? Uh, I mean, that's central to everything for mm -hmm. us. This is really, it's really up to Syrians to make a difference mm -hmm. inside their country. Mm -hmm. What organizations like us can do is just help them do what they want to do. I mean, these folks get up every morning and they reach out to their neighbors and they make a difference. It's these people, it's these efforts that we're coming alongside and supporting. As the Syrian refugee crisis continues to unfold, Minnesota remains one of the fewer states willing to accept Syrian refugees. In fact, Minnesota has been assisting and welcoming large communities of refugees to settle here for decades. In the early 1990s, Minnesota became home to the largest Somali community in the nation. Many of the first Somali newcomers arrived through voluntary agencies. Today, there are currently over 30,000 Somalis residing in Minnesota. We have uh, over 100,000 Hmong in Minnesota mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. yep. I think we have Somalis, we have Liberians. I think we've understood that these people can become an integral part of our economy. They fill jobs that maybe others are not filling. Uh, they start businesses, and so that is a part of it too, and that's how America, um, I think, has been able to be a stronger country. Since the rise of ISIS, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, the threat of global terrorism has been on high alert. One of the Paris attackers entered Europe as a refugee firing a debate on whether or not to let more refugees resettle in the U.S. due to security measures. Over the last few years in Minnesota, there have been Somali immigrants who have gone or attempted to go to Syria to join ISIS. Many are concerned that with these Syrian refugees, members of ISIS will slip through. Do you think that this is a valid concern? They're trying to put an emphasis on getting additional refugees into uh, the mix from Syria. But in the last three years, we've only taken one and a half thousand folks from inside Syria. Okay. So, uh, you know, the Syrians are not, have certainly not been a burden on the U.S. to this point. The U.S. has a very strict and rigorous protocols that, that, that a person has to go through in order to come here. We have an intense vetting process that's much more than it was when we had the um, Somalis came in. Um, it takes you know, 14 to 18 months. It's a 14 point thing where they have to go through a number of steps uh, to be able to even allow the Syrian refugees in post 9-11, we've just developed a much more intense vetting process. And what people have to remember is that these are legal vetted refugees like the Hmong, legal vetted refugees. That's what they would be. They are not people who are undocumented or who you don't know their background. If they have had a criminal, you know stuff about them. Mm -hmm. uh, you do an extensive background check and it is very different. With a large concern for some terrorists 
exploiting a major Syrian resettlement here in the U.S. Do you think we're prepared for another large group of refugees to settle in the U.S. and even possibly here in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. I think it's clear it's not going to be that large mm -hmm. when uh, we're talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30, even if we got up to 65,000, as I asked for, it would be over a period of years. Okay. Um, I don't think they would all come to Minnesota, actually, because we have so many Somalis mm -hmm. and Liberians. Uh, the Syrians have tended to go to Chicago and some other places. Um, I hope we would get some. Okay. Uh, over the, the there's a number of them that I met, <laughs> very well educated, and I just, I happened to just walk through and meet whoever I ran into. Um, and so a lot of them speak English. Mm. Uh, you have people, it's a little self-selecting, sadly, for the country of Syria. A lot of the professionals are leaving okay. um, because they have the means to leave. They have a way to, they have a cell phone to track. They have, they, they're healthy enough to be able to walk you know, a month or two to get out and get on these rafts. Um, so there are people that I know we would want to have in our country. So we have to remember that as well. If we do accept a large number of Syrian refugees and if some do settle here in Minnesota, how will we prepare for that? Well, as we have in the past, we actually brought in a number of people from Burma, and I don't think anyone really noticed mm -hmm. it. Um, and we have a very good process here for people keeping people connected to each other but then because our economy is better by making helping them to get jobs and things like that um, but I don't think right now so far we've been slated to get a huge number of Syrian refugees they tend to go where there are Syrians already um, and we may but it's just not right so far that hasn't happened up next on our issues Twin Cities the hopes for a peaceful Syria Today, the Obaid family has slowly been settling in their new life. Mohammed goes to English class during the day, works at a local company in boxing and storage at night, and Ramya tends to her children, making sure they are off to school on time and adjusting to a whole new world. You both started from zero. We started from zero. It's like I've been reborn and have no parents to tell me what to do. You don't speak the language. You don't know anyone. This is the most difficult part. That's why I'm going to school to learn the language. Ramya says watching the news brings back bad memories of their unimaginable experience. But they often wonder what will become of their beloved country. <laughs> do you miss Syria? We miss Syria so much. When we came to the U.S., we forgot our hardship in Jordan. Our thoughts are continuously with Syria. Our life in Syria was beautiful before the war. Do you think of ever returning to Syria? No, we have nothing left. Our home was demolished. People miss their homes, but it saddens me that I don't want to go back to see what has become of my home. Plus, in our country, even before the war, we've always been suppressed by our government. Once you come to the U.S., you are treated like a human. Why would we go back? Since the violence broke out in 2011, at least half a million people have fled their homes, seeking safety in Middle Eastern and European countries, making Syrians the world's largest refugee population. What are your hopes for the international community when it comes to the Syrian refugee crisis? I hope we ramp up the humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's shocking to me is that at the same time that we are, you know, um, seeing a crisis of hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of folks coming into Europe, at the same time, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees are being taken off food assistance in the region because there simply isn't enough money to pay for it. So this is... It's kind of crazy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we be doubling down with our humanitarian assistance, making sure that refugees have enough food to eat, mm -hmm. making sure their kids can go to school, mm -hmm. and hopefully over the next few years, helping them to keep alive, you know, to sort of build their cap capital over mm -hmm. that time. What is the key then to a future peaceful Syria? Conflict has to stop. Uh, and um, folks are working on that. Mm -hmm. Our focus mm -hmm. is ensuring that Syrians survive this mm -hmm. yep. and to begin helping them rebuild their lives. I'm hopeful mm -hmm. that we will uh, up our numbers so that we take a, you know, an amount that will be viewed in the world as helpful, mm -hmm. uh, that we did our part, uh, not that we 
take the lead number, but that we do our part. I think that helps us in our relations with other countries as the world is increasingly uh, globally connected. Um, I hope that there is a resolution to this conflict. So those 11 million people have displaced, 11 million people, half the country, 4 million of them have now fled the country as refugees, but the other 7 million are there in Syria. So of course my immediate hope um, is that we help to resolve that conflict and there's an international negotiation uh, so many people can come back. I'd like to see some kind of a safe zone uh, where people can live without being in fear of conflict so they don't flee the country. Uh, so those are some of the things I would like to see in the near future. The Obaids say they are lucky, lucky for the opportunity to start over, as so many Syrians never got that chance. What are your hopes for the future of Syria? There's not a single country in the world that hasn't gotten involved in Syria. Some people are with one side and some people are with the other side. There's no resolution. Both sides are wrong. There is no solution. It will remain this way for years to come. People are dying. Children are dying. When a bomb drops down and kills a baby, what did that baby do to Syria, to the government to deserve this? What every Syrian wants is for the war to be over. Yeah. This is what everybody's waiting for in order to rebuild the country. So whenever there is consensus about how to support Syria to, you know, for the war to end, that would be the number one solution for every single Syrian. They all want to go back home. You know, I haven't met one single Syrian who didn't wish to go back home once everything is fine. So it's not like people are happy to go seek asylum in Europe or anywhere else. The favorite solution for them is to go back home and work on the rebuilding of their country. Although the Obama administration is confident in its decision to take in 10,000 Syrian refugees by next year following the influx of terrorist attacks overseas, the question of whether or not the U.S. will increase this number still remains. Thank you for joining me this week on Our Issues Twin Cities. I'm Rena Kamal. See you next time.